I think I did that. There comes the mic. I think I did that without the mic this morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's so good to see each and every one of you this morning. Welcome to Salute a Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Jeff. It's so good to have you here this morning. You know, I, I was thinking a few minutes ago, you have a choice. You have a choice on Sunday morning, whether to be in church or to be doing something else. And you made a choice to come and worship with us this morning. And I thank you for that. The Lord thanks you for that. You know, people sometimes... Thanks, uh, th- may think it's a hard thing to do coming into the Lord's house. It's challenging because everybody here, everybody here has their life together, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. When you come to church, you find out, you figure out that we're just a bunch of broken people that realize we needed a Savior. We needed a Savior for our lives. And it's good to come into the Lord's house to worship Him to praise him for all all that he's done. So I would ask you this morning, truly relax in the presence of the Lord. Be here to rejoice and to worship him and just to praise him for all that he's done. You know, one last observation I'm going to make this morning that y'all can't see, but I can. We are absolutely getting back to normal. Miss Lavinia and Miss Ann are sitting right where they belong. So is Pat and Talmadge, right? They're right where they belong. We're getting back to normal. It's little things like that that just put a smile on my face. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much. I praise your holy name. I thank you, Father, for getting us back to normal, for allowing us to be in your house. Father, allowing us to be in this great community that we live in, this great state that we live in, Father, where we can worship you. Father, I pray for our brothers and sisters out on the West Coast that are struggling, fighting, having to fight the government to be in the Lord's house this morning. Father, we are truly blessed not to have to fight that fight this morning just to praise you and to worship you, Father, to adore you for who you are. Father, I just pray this morning you would be with each and every person that's here in person but also online. Father, that we would experience, truly experience your presence. And we would sing these songs of worship to you. We would study the word and that you would reveal yourself in an intimate, intimate manner this morning. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all please stand? Of praise, and these are the days. 
first one, uh, this one is really special. So I didn't do this last Sunday because we had the children come up with VBS and uh, I wanted to make this really special. So I want to ask anyone that helped with Vacation Bible School, whether it was helping with decorations or if you were here, would you please stand up? I need you to stand up if you helped at all. Can we give all of these folks a hand? I, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, um, because without all of those that stood, and there's many more that helped that either aren't here or they didn't stand up, VBS could not have happened. So I just want to thank everyone uh, for that. Uh, also, just a couple announcement-wise things coming up. If you're on the youth committee, we're going to have a really quick meeting at 4 o'clock today at the church, just to go over a couple of things that are coming up for the youth. Um, and speaking of that, so this Friday, August 7th, starting at 6, we're going to have a back-to-school event. So we're going to have a time of prayer and worship here in the sanctuary um, that I'm really excited about. But afterwards, we're also going to have a time where we're going to have s'mores and just be able just to hang out and fellowship together. Um, so I'm really excited about that. So if you know of any uh, middle schoolers, high schoolers, please let them know about that. It's going to start at 6. Um, so I hope to see all of you all there. Good morning. Just a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, the preschool graduation is not the bulletin, but it's going to be today at 3 p.m. if anybody's interested in going to that. Also, make note of the Bible study um, from the book of Daniel. It's going to start Wednesday, this Wednesday night, August the 5th. And the last announcement is please remember after the service, if you're on this side of the sanctuary, to leave out this door. And then um, this side will go out the, the, the main entrance here. And the middle just wait until the right side is uh, all the way out. For this morning's scripture reading, I'm going to read Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. It says, Thus says the Lord, Curses the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear. When heat comes, but its leaves will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. You know, I just thought about this, and oftentimes in this world we're, we're told to trust the man to lead us and to, to give us plans for our lives. But we quickly, quickly realize that man really can't, can't give us the answer to our problems. If we're going to achieve God's goals for our life, we really have to follow his plans for our lives, too. For this uh, week's prayer request, remember Miss Norma Abel and also Miss Marsu. Does anybody else have any other prayer requests they'd like to, to mention this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. So Lord, we thank you for this morning, for this service. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship in your house. Lord, we just ask you to be with those prayer requests mentioned this morning. And those others in our church who are sick or hurting, and the medical staff that are, that are treating so many around our community. Lord, and it's my prayer that we would follow the plans you have for our lives, Lord, and focus on you and not man. All these things I ask in your holy and precious name. Amen. <laughs>
Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for this day that we can come and worship and go and serve. And we just thank you for uh, your love and care, undeserving as we are. And I ask now that you bless the gifts and use them to bring honor and glory to you. Be with folks that are sick in our community, those that travel the highways, keep them safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. She is going to lead us in our next song, but she asked if, since this is a hymn and everyone should know it, if everyone could please stand and we're going to sing along with her. So if everyone could please stand. <laughs> Pastor Jeff doesn't want me to do the family corner. I have the berries up here. They're, they're ready. 
All right, so I have something I'm really excited about. When you get older, you get really excited about stuff like this. I have my own little whiteboard. Isn't that cool? Just bought this from Staples. I'm super excited about it. All right, so I'm going to test it out and see if it works. All right, so I have a Sharpie. So whiteboards are supposed to be able to erase anything, right? So let's just see. All right, so I wrote a word up here. This is sin, right? I just thought black will write sin on. So this is supposed to be one of those boards you can erase stuff. So Levi, let's see if you can erase it. Well, you're not, you're not trying hard enough. Like, really? All right, so Noah, let's see if you can do it. All right, you're, you're, you're tough, right? You just, did you just lick my board? Come on. You, I, don't, I don't have gloves, so I don't know if I can continue on with this. Can we edit the camera real quick? All right, well, you know what? He, he, he's, he's not getting it. So what, what, should I, what should I do with it? Yeah, I should just throw it away now. But I can do that. I can do that because I bought this. I bought this, it's mine, so since it's ruined <laughs> and has someone sit on it, I can throw it away. <laughs> Did you know what that makes me, that reminds me of? You know, to God, he created us, so we're his. And after he created us, we sinned. We disobeyed him. So he has every right to just get rid of us. And the Bible says that one day he will punish all sin. Did you know that? That one day he will punish us. So kind of like me having to get rid of this whiteboard that's no good. God will have to get rid of all sin. And he actually told, there's a group of people in Jeremiah chapter 18. He told the nation of Israel that he was going to punish them. But before he did that, in verse 11, he said, Turn now each from your evil way and correct your ways and your deeds. He told them that they could turn away and stop doing the bad things that they were doing and that he would forgive them. That's called repentance. He was saying, if you guys repent, I won't punish you. So, kind of like, if I could find a way to fix this, I would keep it. And God said, if you repent, I'll turn away my punishment from you. Well, I have something else. This is really cool. This is a red marker. Yeah, have you seen it before? I saw this on the internet. So, let's, we'll see if it works. So, if I cover up the sin, yeah, I gotta trace it. Well, I gotta do it like really good because I tried it just tracing it and it didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> I need some hand sanitizer for that. But you know, if I cover cover this up with my red marker, you know, this reminds me of when we truly do repent of our sin. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus covers us. So kind of like this red marker is just covering up this word sin. Jesus' blood covers us up. So let's see if we can erase it now. The boys, y'all didn't have any luck. So let, let's see if the, the girls. You want to erase it? Look oh. at that. Now, hey, look, she did it. She didn't even need spit. So now, <laughs> it's, it's brand new. And so what I want us to remember, what Pastor Jeff is going to get ready to preach on, is we deserve God's punishment because of our sin. And because of our sin, we're ruined, just like that Sharpie ruined this board. But if we repent of our sin, turn away from our sin, and trust in Jesus, His blood will clean us clean. We will be forgiven of all of our sin. Alright? So remember that. When Pastor Jeff talks about this idea of repentance, maybe you can remember this. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this day. And God, I pray that you will be with Pastor Jeff as he comes and gets ready to share your word with us. I pray that you will speak to our hearts this morning. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. is my turn to speak finally. I, uh, I was so excited. I, I'm kind of out of sorts. Anybody see anything different about me today? Glasses. I've got glasses on. Uh, so I'm not sure what's going to happen when I get to this first step right here. I, I, I went to the eye doctor on Wednesday, which is supposed to make your eyes better, right? And, and since Wednesday, I cannot put my contacts in my eyes. And so I go back this Wednesday to see what's happening. But I'm going to need glasses today. But I was so excited after Emma sang, I had a flashback. And so I'm showing you all the things that are rattling around my brain right now. Uh, back in 2011, I'd always wanted a motorcycle. 
I always wanted a motorcycle. And I finally got me a motorcycle, got me a Harley, big old Harley. And uh, I had to take a class to get my uh, certification. What, is that what you call it, Pat? The, the credential, the endorsement. That's what I'm looking for, the word endorsement. I had to take a class. Uh, what's that? Uh, well, so I, I, I took this class, and it was through the Harley store, and one of the words of advice that they gave me as a new rider was, um, you're going to be nervous when you start riding. You're going to be in traffic. Uh, so to relax yourself, sing a song. And so here I was in Austin, Texas, driving through traffic, singing, standing on the promises. And, and everybody here, standing on the I, I just said, I didn't care who was around me. And I know people thought I was nuts, but thank you for that little flashback to a great time in my life. I still sing when I write. I can't help it. I like doing it. It's just, uh, you know, I'm out in God's, God's great creation, just enjoying life. And uh, when Kelly rides with me, I guess we have a little choir thing going or something because we're both, well, I don't know if she sings or not, but I do sing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you. Thank you so much for blessing us so abundantly to be in your house this morning. Father, I just, I thank you for this time that we can study your word. I thank you for the privilege to have your words for us, Father, the Bible, to reveal yourself to us. And I just pray this morning as we go through this passage that we would see your sovereignty, that we would see your authority over all things. And Father, we would submit to you in all things in our lives. Father, I just pray that each and every person would uh, just stop thinking about the outside world and just focus, focus upon you in these next few minutes especially. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I had, uh, I'm having all sorts of flashbacks, so I'm going to go to another flashback of something, but this is part of my sermon this morning. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Kelly and I went on a date. Now, this was no ordinary date. You know, we go on a lot of dates, but this was no ordinary date. We were going with a lot of couples, so I guess you would call it a group outing, a group, I, I don't know what you would call it. It was, it was a bunch of friends that were going out, we were going to have a good time, but this is something the ladies had put together, and so we were going to the Art Smart Academy in Irmo, uh, South Carolina, to learn pottery, to learn pottery, right? So think about Jeff for a second and think about my lack of creativity that I have. When I draw, when I do anything artistic, it's stick people, right? It can be a dog, it can be a cat, it can be uh, a big person, a little person, it's gonna be stick people. Wayne, I'm just not, I'm not artistic, right? I know Wayne is artistic. He's got that artistic talent in his body. I just don't have anything. So I might as well have been going to a dance class a dance academy. I, I was nervous. I was not ready to go. I, I was just, the only thing I've ever done with clay is shoot clay pigeons, right? And I'm comfortable in that world, but not in this world to deal with clay that I was going to go into. But we went with several couples and we had a great time. I mean, I, I surprised myself. I had a great time. I learned how to make pottery. Right? It, was, it was pretty cool. There's a process. Right? You start with the clay that you have, and the clay has to be the right density. It has to have water added to it. It has to, has to be ready and pliable where you can work with it. Uh, it it, it, it is, is, just has to be just right to work with. It needs to be ready to submit to your hands. And then you have this thing called wheel that sits and spins, and you control the speed of which it's spinning, or spinning and you have to take that clay at least this is what I got out of it. You take that clay and you, you have to put it in the center of the wheel, right? And so I took pleasure in slamming my clay down onto the wheel because it had to be centered and it had to be grounded. Otherwise, the clay, the, the clay would go flying off the wheel. It would go bye-bye, as my granddaughter would say. And as the wheel turns, you use your hands ever so slightly, ever so gently to modify that clay. And, and you, you have to have patience as you're working with it. You're using both hands to cup that clay. You're, you're, you're using utensils even, if you will. Uh, you have to have a vision. Vision is paramount when you're working with this. You have to know, you have to be thinking about what you're going to create. And if you mess up, and more than likely you will if it's your first time, you relent. You start over. And you can start with the same clay, or you can change the clay if you want to. 
For us, we were making two things. And you may wonder why I have a box up here. I was trying to sneak this up here without anybody seeing what was in here. This is kind of like show and tell. I, I, I'm going to set it right here for now. And I'm getting to the sermon, I promise you. This was the model. I'd like to say this is what Jeff created, but it's not. This is the model. Right? This was the bowl that they had. Uh, you can see it's, it's very nice. It has decorative trim on it. It has little handles on it. It's got a base. I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. That was, that was supposed to be our vision. And so I got on board. And I made a camo version of this. The camo with my touch. But you can see I actually, I mean, I, I kind of did what they were doing. It's not the same, not nearly the same size, nor the beauty of their model. But I, I have the interior. I have the walls. I have some ridges on the side. I have a base. Now, Kelly, it's not bad. Kelly made this. I'm not sure how this happens when you have your hands cupped around it. But she did it in a certain way. And I actually think hers is more pretty than mine because I see, I see some variation in the thickness and I see something like gold trim at the top. She's turned this into a gravy bowl, right? And she had a vision of what it could be. We also made a cup. It was supposed to be a coffee cup. Now, I didn't bring you a coffee cup because I know everybody in here knows what a coffee cup looks like. And I'm going to show you, this is my coffee cup. It, it didn't turn out too well. Uh, I stayed with the camo theme. Um, I think this looks like something you'd serve Asian tea or something. Kelly said, no, it's a vase, a, a coin jar. I don't know. One of the fellows that went with us, he got the handle on it, and, and it was wonderful. I mean, he, he, he was, he's kind of the kind of guy that uh, believes in go big or go home, and, and, and he did it just right. He made his cup with a handle, and it was actually functional. Mine hasn't been functional. It's been in the closet. In fact, I had to have Kelly dig it up for us to find it. Uh, but you know what? Clay pottery, it was created by Kelly and I, and it's beautiful. It was something I made with my hands. Now, mind you, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And because I made that, I see it as beautiful because it's something I made. The Bible tells us in Isaiah, uh, and you don't need to turn to Isaiah necessarily. We're going to be in Jeremiah if you want to go ahead and turn there. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 64, 8, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. And all we are the work of your hands. We are the clay. We are the work of your hands. The Bible also tells us in Ephesians, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should work, walk in them. These two verses give us a great picture of God creating us, God molding us into who we are, and that we're created by him to do good works for him. We are within his hands at all times, his grips at all times. Today, as I mentioned, we're going to be in Jeremiah. We're going to go look at an old story, an ancient story uh, of the potter and the clay. If you want to go ahead and turn to Isaiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah uh, chapter 18. Jeremiah is one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. His ministry extended from 627 B.C. to 587 B.C., 40 years. And uh, you may have heard when Brandon was, uh, or maybe it was when Cason was speaking. Did you quote from Jeremiah this morning? Uh, Jer he, there's a phrase. He's the prophet known as the one that used the word of the Lord. He used, thus saith the Lord, uh, 150 times of 400 times that it's mentioned in the Old Testament. He warned people about their, their, their uh focus upon themselves, their reliance on ritual and formalism, uh, showing the world what they were versus actually being in a relationship with God. He was warning them to uh, turn away from these things, to actually blush in the presence of God, knowing that they needed to be holy in his presence, and, and they were just totally opposite of that. God wanted them, and he was speaking through Jeremiah to tell them to be holy, to be in a relationship with him, to realize their dependence upon him, and to align their life with him. It's a very consistent message that we see. And today in the passage that we're going to read, we're going to see this great example that God lays out before Jeremiah's eyes that Jeremiah is to learn from and then to share with the Israelites, specifically Judah. And so we're going to be in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 18. I'm going to read that for you this morning. Jeremiah 18 
verses 1 through 11. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house. There he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And in the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it not, does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I said I would benefit it. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, there's that phrase, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now and make everyone from his evil ways, evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. <clears throat> Such a great old story of the ancient days, of the ancient days in the Old Testament that we can read about. You know, as you look at this, I, li I like to spend time going through passages and just digging deeper. That's what I always call it on Wednesday nights, digging deeper into God's Word and understanding the different uh, meanings, the different phrases, if you will. And in this one, we're going to break it down some and look at it. First look at verses 1 through 4, where God instructs Jeremiah to go to the potter's house. He says, Arise and go down, and you will hear Yahweh's voice. You will hear the words of God. You will understand what God desires of you as you go into the potter's house. Now, it's interesting because if you, have, you look at the ancient, or you look at the Hebrew to understand the words, when you hear potter, when Jeremiah heard potter, he quickly would have seen that that word has a similar meaning to the word shaper in uh, the Old Testament Hebrew times. Shaper, and it's, it's a word that was used that was very similar when you think of the days of creation uh, in Genesis 1, uh, when you see creation. And so Jeremiah quickly would have had a reflective moment where he thinks about Yahweh, and he thinks about the potter, and he understands as he's looking at the potter working with the clay that is a mixture of uh, clay and moisture that God created, Yahweh created, from the dust. He started with dust, and he breathed into that dust to make man. And from man he made woman. From the rib of man he made woman. And so you have God creating, you have God shaping the world as we know it, all mankind through his efforts. Everything that was created was through the master's hand, the creator's hand. And so Jeremiah instantly, when he hears this word, has this on his mind as he goes in to the potter's house. And as he walks in, place yourself in that setting and see what Jeremiah sees. He sees the potter working at the wheel, working on a vessel. It, it doesn't say what the vessel is. It doesn't say uh, how long he's been there, but we see the potter sitting there uh, at the wheel working on the vessel. And the vessel, the clay becomes marred is what it tells us. It becomes marred. So something has happened to this clay. But the potter quickly uses the same clay and starts to rebuild it, to remake it, to remold it into something else. And I love the phrase here, so he made it again into another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter. We see the love, and we see the patience, and we see the grace and the mercy from the potter because he could have picked that clay up and thrown it out and just dismissed it entirely. But he didn't. He relented. He just restarted. He showed patience in what he was doing with this clay. And as we look at this, we see love love that he has for his creation. And we can think instantly of our Heavenly Father. Jeremiah reflects and thinks of the Heavenly Father. You see, the potter was in complete control of the clay at that moment. He could have thrown it out, but he continued to work steadfastly on this, this clay to make it into something. 
We see the love of the Heavenly Father that does the same thing with us as we might have something unholy in our, our minds, our bodies, our spirits, as we might be tarnished, we might be marred in our own lives. God the master, God the potter also will work with us and formulate us into what he wants us to be. We see a great reflection of God's authority in all things that he can start and stop at any times. We see that clay might have been inferior, but God still works with this clay. God still works just like the potter did with the clay in our own bodies, our own minds. He works with us. And this is, this is a message of hope for anybody that's out there that may be in a time of, of stress or distress in your life. It's never too late. Give it to God and allow him to rework you, re remold you, to, to relent in the old ways and, and, and allow God to remold you in what he intended you to be. It's such a great message of hope. God is never done with us. He's continually working in us and through us. In Philippians 1.16, the Bible reminds us, being confident in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is not done with us. Even in your darkest days, if you'll return to God, he will continue to work in and through you and remake you into what he wants you to be. In verses 5 and 6, God reveals the meaning of the metaphor. He says, Can I not do with you as this potter? As the clay is in his hands, you're in my hands. Now, mind you, this verse is very specific at this time for Israel, but it's also for us as we read God's holy word. I've got a short video that Billy's going to cue up. I just want you to watch this and experience this, this video for just a moment. We are like clay, static, unrecognizable, nothing, a formless mass, no direction, no purpose, no meaning. We are like clay, pliable, movable, moldable, in the hands of the Creator, we can be changed made beautiful, given life. Nothing becomes something extraordinary. The transformation takes time. The process is tedious, difficult, painstaking. But soon, we see the beginnings of something wonderful. The formless takes shape. The unrecognizable finds its identity. The meaningless is given purpose. From nothing comes beauty. We are like clay, each piece different than the next, given unlimited potential in the hands of the potter. I can't help but get emotional every time I watch that. Because truly in this video, you see the love of the potter's hands, right? The patience, the endurance, the grace, the mercy, making this clay, which is worthless by itself, into something special. And I love that you see both hands. And if we think about our lives, we're completely in the, the grip of Jesus Christ. Every aspect of our lives, we're in his hands. And yes, there's times that we may feel pressure in our lives. That's God allowing us to change and to be molded into what he wants us to be. There's so many folks that want to run away from pain, want to run away from stress. They want to get away from that which is hurting them. But I would tell you that if you allow God to mold you in that moment, if you would praise him and seek him, truly seek him in that moment. You see, that's a special time when you're being made into something special, something valuable in the potter's hands. You see, God has complete control, complete authority. 
in every aspect of our lives. He makes us and molds us. I heard a preacher this week. There's a doctrine of sovereignty that we have forgotten. Sovereignty. God has complete control of all things. I heard a preacher this week. I'm not going to name names, although I want to. I heard a preacher say, especially if you think about in these days of individual autonomy that we live in, it's my right to do what I want to do. I need to be able to live my life the way I want to live it. I heard a preacher say that theology needs more elasticity. That we need to broaden what God's word says to be more acceptable into our world. I strongly disagree with that. I strongly disagree with that. We need to heed God's word as it is written and realize that it's not about us. It's absolutely about glorifying God in all that we do. Heaven have mercy upon these preachers and teachers that are trying to tear up God's word and teach it falsely out into this world to make it convenient. You know, it's interesting because the Bible warned us of this. The Bible warned us of all things that we're facing. The Bible tells us what to expect. The persecution that we see in California should not catch anybody off guard. The burning of the Bibles that's occurring up in Oregon should not catch anybody off guard. The fact that we have teachers and preachers that are preaching falsely about God's word, taking that out of context should not surprise us at all. It's all foretold in this precious book that people say is worthless and outdated, that I would say is absolutely what everybody needs in their life. We need to heed God's word and listen to God's word and realize that he is the creator and we are the created. We are to submit to him in all things. We are here for his glory. His glory, not ours. Not our convenience. Not, it's not about us at all. It's not about us. As we go on and look at this, verses 7 through 10, God's truth is revealed in this passage. We can be sure that if we obey, that we will be blessed. But we can also be sure that if we disobey, that we will not be blessed. We will be punished instead. If we're living right but turn to evil, God will punish us. If we're living wrong but we re relent, we repent, God will relent and bless us. You see, it's very clear that God is in complete control. And he lays this out so eloquently for Jeremiah to understand in this passage. It's clear for us to see. You see, this is why God includes stories and illustrations like this in the Bible so that we can comprehend what he truly means. He gave us this story as an example for us to understand. And then he tells Jeremiah at the very end that God is fashioning a disaster against you because of your evil ways. Repent and turn from the evil and go and do good. That was his message that he wanted Jeremiah to convey. Now, if you read on through Jeremiah, you'll see that Jeremiah was persecuted for relaying God's message. Just like a lot of Christians will be persecuted for relaying God's truth out into this world. And so what do we do with this? This is where I always get every week. What do we do with this? How do we deal with this, this message? You see, I love this story because it does show us God's grace and God's mercy, God's love for us. It's a great illustration. It's a great story. But there's three things I would ask you to pick out of this and truly understand. You see, a lot of times we think about the potter and the clay, and we kind of we get it. But look at the depth of the meaning, the depth of the different pieces. First is that the potter is God. God is the potter. It's not a thing. It's not karma. I absolutely dis, dis, just cannot stand when people talk about karma. There's no such thing as karma in this world. It's God's provision upon us. God is a person. God is our creator. God is our provider. Our lives are not in the hands of mere circumstance, but rather God, almighty God, who controls all things. He is our creator and our provider. He's our father. 
He alone has the power to guide our lives and direct our lives in all things that we do. And if we doubt, if we curse, if we disobey, we should expect punishment on those things, discipline. And you know what? The Bible also tells us that those that get disciplined, they're loved by their heavenly father or their earthly father. When you discipline, you love somebody because you're trying to help them out. He has a plan for us that we cannot even fathom or understand. God has a plan for us. He can see the end road just like the person making the pottery can see where they want that piece of clay to go. God has a vision. God has a plan. God is crafting us into exactly who he wants us to be. He is the potter, and he's fashioning you to who and what he wants you to be in this life. The second thing that I would have you to understand is the clay. We are the clay. God patiently directs our lives in all that we do. He often uses the hands of others. He uses his hands, but he'll use our family's hands, our friends' hands, our teachers' hands, our fellow Christians' hands, and even those that persecute us. He will use them to mold us into what he wants us to be. But clay by itself, understand and truly believe this, has no value by itself. Clay has no value, but it can be, it become something great once the potter gets a hold of it, once the potter is allowed to craft it into who it needs to be and what it needs to be, it then has value into it. The most important attribute of clay is that the clay would yield to the master. That is what we're called to do, is to yield to the master. And when you find yourself in that, you'll find yourself being molded into who God wants you to be. The last piece is the wheel. Most people don't talk about the wheel. Because it's just there. It's part of the scene. We don't really understand it. But I want you to understand that the wheel is life. Life is the wheel in this example that we're seeing. It's spun about, around and around by the potter. The potter is controlling the speed of the wheel in this vent. And our lives are they're not controlled by mere chance or luck. It's by the master in our lives. And the other thing we have to understand is it's not about the size of the wheel. The, the wheel can be any size. Just like our life can be any length, it can be long, it can be short. It's about the quality of what's happening with the wheel. You see, if the wheel is centered and the clay is centered onto the wheel, then the, the, the master, the potter, the clay, and the wheel, they're all in sync, they're all in unison. That's where we need to be, is yielding to the master and being centered onto this wheel. And for me, in my life, this is where I got to the, the title of this message, it, it's, it's actually from a song, but I, I don't want you to think about who sings the song or what the song sounds like. But Jesus, take the wheel. Take my wheel. Take my life and control every aspect of it. Make me and mold me and create me into who you want to be, no matter what it means for me. If it's pain that I have to go through, if it's stress that I have to go through, I have friends and family right now going through some extremely hard times. And all I'm asking them to do is look to the Master. Right? I can't provide you the answer other than to look to God's Word and seek His Word and His will. Yes, you're going through pain, but it will get better. I can guarantee you it will get better as long as you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. It will be better. Come what may in this world, it will be better. Cling to the Master. Allow the Master to make you and mold you. And if it is a pressure point, allow that pressure point to change you for what God wants you to be. And in those times when you mess up, and when I mess up, I'm preacher, yes, I'm pastor, yes, I'm not perfect, I'm far from perfect. Ask the person sitting in the sound booth, I am not perfect. No amen from Kelly. She's pointing at Billy, like Billy would say, Billy will say an amen. I'm not perfect. You're not, none of us are. And so what do we do? We repent. We turn away from whatever that is, and then the master will relent. He says so in here. If we turn back to the ways, uh, his ways, he will relent and continue to bless us. For me in my house, I pray. I pray. Jesus, take the will. Take every aspect of the will. Make me into who you want me to be, whatever that means for my life, be it good or bad, in accordance with what this world thinks. Because you know what? What this world thinks doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It just doesn't. What matters to me is what's in that book and what my, my God, God, the Creator, the Lord Almighty, thinks of me. That's all that matters. My question 
that I'll just leave with as I prepare to close. Who or what? Who or what has control of your will? Because it can be a what. It can be something that you worship in this life. And you say, Jeff, how does that make sense? Where are you spending your time? Where are you spending your time? Is it on video games? Is it watching TV? Is it hunting, fishing, baseball, softball? I'm not picking on any of them. I'm picking on every one of them. And I'm guilty as charged, too. If I'm throwing out a fish line instead of worshiping God, now, God wants you to have downtime to relax and enjoy life. But if you have something that's taken more priority in your life than worshiping God, there is a problem, and you need to recognize it. So what or who has control of your life? You can still do those things and worship God. I want you to understand that. I was a baseballer. I'm not picking on baseball. My son played a lot of baseball. My daughter played a lot of softball. Then she became a dance, and my mind was really blown when she started dancing because I knew nothing about that, but we always spent time in God's Word when we were out there doing that. We found times to have devotionals. We had time to really seek God's Word. You have to include God. You have to allow God to control your will, control your life. You see, life is the will. Jesus, take the will, not the steering wheel. Take the will of my life. Take everything about my life and change me, make me, and mold me in every aspect of it. That's where we need to be. And if you're not there this morning, make a change. Because he tells us right here, repent, turn away from it, return to me. Repent and I will relent. It's an easy phrase, repent and I will relent. Seek the Lord in all that you do. As I come to a close this morning, I would ask you, where, where are you in your walk with Jesus? What is the priority in your life. Only you know the answer to that. Is Jesus a priority in your life? Jesus, take the wheel. Perhaps, perhaps you don't even know who Jesus is. I would love to introduce you to this, this man the greatest man that ever walked this earth. My Lord, my Savior, my King, my King. Yes, I have a King, and his name is Jesus. I would invite you to come and know this man. Your life will never be the same. It's the greatest decision that you can ever make to come to know this man. Perhaps you straight away, perhaps you've allowed other things to get in your way. You've allowed your will to be broadened. You've allowed elasticity of this world to jump into your brain. That's okay, because Jesus tells us, return to me. Turn away from that. Return to me, and I'll relent. I will will bless you beyond what you could ever imagine. Not blessed in in terms of the worldly ways, but bless you in your walk with your relationship with him. Perhaps you just need to return. Perhaps you're looking for a church home. We're Bible teaching, Bible preaching. I say that every week, but I mean that with all my heart and soul. We will not, as long as I'm standing up here, we will not deviate from God's truth, God's word. That's where we're called to be, in God's word. It is perfect, absolutely perfect, as written. We don't need any other changes to it. We don't need any other words written by man to be added to it. We preach and teach God's word and God's word alone. So this morning, I would ask you to seek God Confess yourself to God. Let your guard down. And let the Spirit of God just overflow in your heart. Lord, I just pray for each and every person here this morning and and those online. Allow us to experience you. Allow us to see this story, this story of old that has so many truths in it. Allow us to realize that we are in your hands that you have complete control and complete authority in all things in this world, including each of us. Father, I just pray, I pray for each and every person that you would speak to their hearts and allow them to see 
where they may have differences, where they may have issues that they need to address. Father, allow them to experience the holiness that only you bring. And allow them to experience the righteousness that they can only obtain through you. Father, I just pray that you'd work in hearts and work in minds. Father, I pray that you'd heal hearts and heal minds. Father, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? just to have a quick seat. We're going to uh, do a vote on our deacons. Brad, you want to take control? <laughs>